subject. And we're in Exodus 12. We're, we're in a subject that we kind of, in fact, we, we sang about it recently. We sing about, we talk about, and I don't, I don't, I don't know but that it doesn't just uh, go right over everybody's head. Um, uh, Brother Pettit, who was with us the other Saturday morning, uh, he, he tells a story about he's starting a church out in Las Vegas and he's been preaching through some Old Testament characters. He said, I'm not really connecting. His wife said, they don't know who you're talking about. This is what they do. So, he's, so he says, well, I'll switch to the New Testament. He said, I'm going to preach on Nicodemus. And uh, he said, how many of you know who Nicodemus is? He said, there's 150 people, 200 people out there. He and his wife had their hand raised. And, uh, and, he, and he said, said, you know, he's a wee little man. And he said, and everybody looked at him really funny then because uh, they didn't know what he was doing, making fun of short people. And uh, anyway, and he said, and when we talk about Passover here, and those of you with uh, young people at home or doing part of our D6 stuff, when, when you're... You're doing this, and you came to this this week, and if you didn't grab, make sure you grab your parent page back there, and this is what your young folks are doing their devotion. I, and I, I'm just curious, if I say Passover, does that mean much of anything to you, Passover? Again, I went to Christian school, but I didn't grow up in church, and I'm, I'm telling you, I had a lot of things very confused, and Passover to me, but the only thing I could connect to it was the children of Israel leaving that night, and the death angel passed over. But that was almost as far as it went, but that was a sky, scads away from everybody else. And the rest of you don't feel badly. And as we talk about this idea of Passover, there's two things on the handout. One's a set of verses on the back. And if I get really boring, you can flip over and start working through those and uh, thinking about what Christ's death and the pass, him being our Passover really and truly means. And so you can do that. But otherwise, we'll kind of stay on the front. And this, uh, this video was kind of recommended to me, and it's just excellent. And maybe it'll help start us just a little bit. Before we get to the video, read with me Exodus 12. Excuse me, Exodus 12 and verse number 1. Maybe I'll get to, maybe I'll get to Exodus instead of Numbers. And, uh, and uh, maybe, that'll, maybe that'll help me a little bit to speak a little more clearly. Exodus chapter 12, if people around you don't have a Bible, make sure you share with them. Verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, You have two people, two leaders, Moses and Aaron. You have a place, Egypt. They, have, they are in hostile territory. Pharaoh is about to be unhappy in the most, uh, the greatest military fighting force that's been on the face of the earth at this point in history is about to say, nope, and chase them. Verse 2, this month shall be in you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Those of you who enjoy that kind of thing have already caught that there is, that there is a different calendars in different parts of the world. And even though we talk about January, we'll hear other folks say this is the this is the new year. Or those of you who have friends who are perhaps from different parts of the world, you know, they'll say, well, this is this and this is that. This is this is a not just a calendar to be different than any type of solar activity or or revolution around the sun. This is a spiritual marker. You start this off this way because of this event, verse 3, speaking all the congregation of Israel. Verse 3, in the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. In other words, where you reside, the household's too little, let he and his neighbor next to him take it according to the number of souls. Every man according to his eating shall make you count for the lamb. They're going to have a barbecue. Nod your head if you understand this. You're going to have a barbecue. Somewhere in my head through the years, I just thought, man, they're doing this and they're kind of burning the thing up. And then when I began to associate but the best smelling place around was either the tabernacle or the temple because they were always baking something or grilling something. And that smell was heavenly, ha-ha. And it, and it was a beautiful kind of thing. You do this because it's going to be a feast. Verse 5, your, limb sh- your lamb shall be without blemish. Male the first year, take it out from among the sheep or the goats. Keep it 14 days. In other words, you keep it. Make sure it doesn't have any diseases. Everybody's going to do the slaughter at the same time. Verse 7, and they shall take the blood and strike or paint it on the two side posts, on the upper door posts of the house 
wherein they shall eat it. Verse 8, And they shall eat the flesh that night, roast with fire and leavened bread. Bitter herbs they shall eat it, and they forever and ever now will call this kind of a meal cedar. And they will do this this way. And this will be part of what you're going to pass along. And so when we talk about this tonight, we're, we're walking through something that we don't walk through often enough. We don't be, we're not reminded enough about it. Let's, let's pray. And as soon as we pray, Mike, if you hit the play on that video back there, Father, <clears throat> in these moments, remind us. In these moments, convict us. And in these moments, thrill us. Our sins, which were many, have all been washed away. So God, would you help us tonight? Would you speak to every heart? Would you remind us, satisfy us, and launch us out thankful for what you've done? We pray this in your son's wonderful name, and amen. May have to put it play, yeah. If you're watching this video, it's likely you have some questions about the Passover. Who celebrates the Passover? Why do the Passover? Well, Passover is a 3,500-year-old celebration of what God did with the Jewish people, with the Israelites. You remember, you've probably seen the movie. They cried out to God for a deliverer. He sent them a deliverer. He sent them Moses. And Moses went to Pharaoh and said 10 times to Pharaoh, let my people go. 10 times Pharaoh said no. And so then God said, allow me to introduce myself. And he sent 10 plagues, beginning with the relatively novel turning the drinking water into blood and culminating, escalating. Finally, the death of the firstborn of all Egypt. How is it that the Jewish people were able to avoid the devastation of this plague, God told them to take a lamb and paint the blood of that lamb on the doorpost and the lintel. And when God came to destroy the firstborn of all Egypt, he saw the blood on the Hebrews' door and he passed over them. And so, from father to son to grandson, generation after generation, the Jewish people commemorate this great act of redemption. And we have what's called a Seder. A Seder is a celebration. Some do more than one Seder. It's a long evening, uh, four hours, five hours, when we retell the story of the Exodus. And we recite certain portions of scripture and we sing certain songs in a certain order, all designed to pass down this great act of redemption from one generation to another. Now, Jewish people have been celebrating Passover and Passover Seders for 3,500 years. But did you know that Christians also participate in Passover? In fact, every time they participate in what's called communion, taking the bread and the cup, they are commemorating Jesus' Last Supper, which was a Passover Seder meal. When at that Last Supper, Jesus took the familiar, redemptive symbols of God's actions at Passover, and he infuses them with new significance as he prepares his disciples for his death, burial, and resurrection, a greater act of redemption, even than the Exodus and the Red Sea. All of us who trust in what our Messiah has done for us, in trusting in that great act of redemption, his death, his burial, and resurrection, we can find true freedom, not from Egyptian slavery, but from the slavery to our sins. You can be free through our Messiah. And when he sets you free, you are free indeed. So you may have further questions, whether you're Jewish or whether you're Christian or whether you're like me, Jewish Christian. And if you do, I wanna invite you to click the button on the page and get connected with someone who would love to talk with you about this and answer those questions. If you keep clicking the button on your page, you'll just get a sore finger. But uh, yeah, I thought that was just uh, very helpful, very concise. I need you to do two things for me. I need you in those first eight verses. I need you to figure out and find out and then holler out, raise your hand, say to your neighbor, what are the components of this Passover meal? What are they supposed to be eating? What are they supposed to be preparing? Let's do a little interactivity. Can we do a little interactivity tonight? Just a little? 
Young people, you can participate. No, Mr. Brandon will give you a dollar for every right answer you get. And uh, how about we got pizza for everybody who gets the right answer? How we go? Yeah. What we got? What we got? All right. If you don't have a Bible and if you're not looking, then you're not participating. So I need you to participate, okay? And Mike, let's see here. If you'll give me my slides, I think I'm good, and I can run it from up here. Thank you, brother. Um, all right. Exodus chapter 12. Somebody figure. Somebody holler it out. What we got? What's a, what's one component? Got to have a lamb. Could be a goat if they said, but but we're we're talking about that. What kind of lamb? Anybody? An unblemished lamb. Somebody else said the second part. What was it? Spotless or unblemished? Yeah. What other kind of lamb? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, and it's got a, so bitter herbs and unleavened bread. She got two of those. A male lamb. We're talking about a male lamb here. That's right. So if you're taking some notes here, we said a male lamb, typically a lamb. If, and again, if, if you couldn't find that, again, there's this kind of poverty exception. You know, if you did find another. What, what was significant about the two weeks? What's the big deal about the two weeks? Anybody? What, what's at least one big deal? They separate the lamb, and they separate the lamb primarily, we understand, to make sure it wasn't sickly. They're going to have something develop. It's going to get uh, scurvy. Eyes are going to bleed. Foot's going to fall off or something like that. And to make sure, make sure the other. If you're doing something 14 days ahead of time, in, unless you're moving, then everything just falls apart. I'm looking around here. But uh, other, than that, other than that, the 14 days, you get time to prepare what? You get time to prepare your heart, don't you? Because every day you got to walk by... We're going to eat it today? Nope. We're going to play with it? Nope. What are we going to do? 14 days. At least. Got to make sure. Got to make sure it's just right. 14 days you inspect it. 14 days you check the teeth. 14 days you look at the eyes. 14 days. Make sure there are no worms. 14 days you make sure this thing is, is okay. 14 days. And every neighbor you've got Doing the same thing. Everybody is preparing and thinking and looking. Casey said the bitter herbs there, and she said the unleavened or unleavened bread, leavening agent or unleavened, uh, anyway you want to see, either way there. And, and it's a difference in, I started to ask Joji, but every time I ask Joji something, I put on the spot, she uh, lets the air out of my tires at home, so I don't want to do that. And uh, I'm teasing. But, a, but most of the time, a yeast donut, you can tell it's a yeast donut because it's fluffy. Am I saying that right? All right, all right. My, you're my confectioner, my baker here. But most of the time, a brownie is not very fluffy, right? Because it doesn't have typically... Any, much, any to much leaven in it, right? In fact, if we get a big old fluffy brownie, we don't call it a brownie, we call it cake, right? It is a difference aside from the chocolate, isn't it? And so they're, they've got these crackers or this bread that is just dense. And so and it's to be baked in a hurry, and the leaven was to say no sin, no sin at all. We want to have anything like that. In here, so 14 days. Now, let me let me help you. Let me help you. If you had to walk by, if you had to walk by something for 14 days, going, we're going to eat that and it's going to be really good. If you had to walk by, if you had to walk by your birthday cake, or you had to, you had to think about, you know, the ice cream. You 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 know, you just you build up some expectation, wouldn't it? There would be a sense of celebration. But let me flip it around here. And this is what I want you to do on the other side of your paper. I want you to think about the guilt that they're starting to feel. Anybody here ever felt guilty? Let me, let me ask a better question. You ever felt guilty and somebody said, that shouldn't bother you? And that just made you feel worse, right? Because you're like, I'm hanging around with heathens. Uh, you, know, you know, it should really bother you too. And you there? Anybody ever woke up feeling bad about something? Just three of you, four of you, five of you. You ever, you ever like, you ever tried to apologize and you made it worse? 
Anybody besides me done that? You just tripped all over yourself, you know, and it went from being a small thing to a large thing, and you're like, I should move to Mars. Uh, at least, I, you know, I couldn't offend anyone there, you know, kind of thing. I want you, and again, we'll, we'll put a trash can in the back, but what's, what's some things recently you felt guilty toward God about? Anybody? Don't tell them out loud. Tell them out loud. Has it been your mouth? Has it been your speech? Has it been something you texted? Has it been something you watched? Has it been something you did with your hands? Has it been something you thought with your mind? Has it been a, an attitude toward God? A sense of disrespect toward family or parents? What, what, what is it? Because every year at least, new calendar, first month of the year, for 14 days, you're going to think about that represents my sin. That represents my guilt. That little, fluffy, perfect little lamb that doesn't know up from down and side to side, who has never harmed a human and doesn't know who a human is and got barely enough brains. This little lamb that will walk off a cliff, that will walk up to thorns and eat until its mouth is bleeding. This little lamb that doesn't know grass from poison. This little lamb that will starve to death because it's not got enough brains to turn around and head back toward water. Who has to have somebody looking out for it. This little lamb is pinned up beside our house. And in 13 days, and in 10 days, and in 8 days, and in 7 days, and in 3 days, and in 2 days. We're going to be reminded when we dress this lamb that it was about my sin and that I couldn't pay my own price. And we're going to look forward to the lamb that's coming who will once for all, for all men, give his life, shed his blood for everyone's sins who's ever lived. And we're going to be reminded. The lamb taking our place. Your notes are there. Anybody got anything you could put down? Maybe I mean, you're like, man, if I write this down, somebody will pick it up and, 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 you know, and then they'll, they'll think I'm not as perfect as I think everybody thinks I am. You may hear I've inflated opinions like that. You think you're the only one with problems, only one with guilt, only ones with things. Isn't it silly, the devil, what the devil tells us? You're the only one struggling with anything. Everybody else got it made. Everybody else is cruising. They're not tempted to anything. This is their instructions. Your first point, your first idea there is God provides deliverance through the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb. This was a judgment and a deliverance. This was a judgment and a salvation. You want to write a note or two down. Someone has to pay for your sins. Someone has to pay for your sins. If you don't have a pen, maybe somebody will share it with you. I've got, I have a pen. Anybody needs a pen? Anybody need a pen? Andre, you got a pen? Good deal. All right. If you need a pen. Somebody has to pay for your sins. I didn't mean to shout in the microphone there. I was working through the, a book called, a, a set of books. I think when they were originally published, there was 12 of them. And, uh, and, and they were called the Fundamentals, a, a group of businessmen, particularly somebody actually in North Carolina, helped pay for these. And they printed millions of these. And these were these are the Fundamentals of the Faith and all this crazy stuff that was coming over from, from Germany, particularly the turn of the century, 19th century. And so they printed them, and they printed them very, very cheaply, and they printed them very inexpensively, and they just fell apart. I actually have an original in my office here. I want to see one. I don't have one of the 12. I, got, I just got one. But they rebound them, did them in a set of four. I was working my way through the set of four, and, and it came up to this thing. And one of the things they were arguing for is that we cannot give up on a biblical view of hell. And the writer did something I'd never seen before at that moment. This is some years ago. He said, he said, hell is a place where you try forever to pay for your own sin. And though that didn't sound right. The more I thought about it, the more I looked at it, the more I thought, studied it. I mean, you know, I wouldn't have said it that way, but that's exactly what it is. Either you can accept what Christ did on the cross for your sin, or you can try 
to pay and satisfy an infinite God who you've infinitely offended and you are infinitely guilty. And you can try and pay for your own sin, but somebody is going to pay for your sin. Somebody's going to bear your guilt. Somebody's going to satisfy the, the justice of God. Again, whatever you thought of what's going on in all the ephemera around it, I don't know, I don't know of a time on network news in, in print in print this morning where, where people have bandied about the word justice and relief. And I didn't follow things close enough to have any clue if justice was done. Truth of the matter is, in today's world, there'll be a few appeals before we really figure out what all is going on anyway. If, you, if you're all upset, don't, don't, you're missing my point. Look at me. We like justice when it's somebody else. We're not real fond of it when it applies to us. You see, the little, little bitty lamb. And you get all worked up about a lamb becoming dinner and you're not all worked up about the fact that Jesus let you live long enough to be confronted with the reality of your sins and the hope of the cross and the good news of the gospel you, you got your priorities just all slap out of whack God provides deliverance it was a judgment Sin had to be paid for. The lamb had to die. The lamb of God would die. As he mentioned, some 3,500 years later, or excuse me, some 2,000, uh, give or take, 1,200 years later, um, 1,400 years later, there is the judgment. There's salvation that's there. There's salvation that's there. God made a way. God made a way. If you did what he commanded you to do and you, and you put the sign on the door, the death angel would pass over. But if not, man, it was going to be, going to be awful. The firstborn would die. And again, even that's a little bit of mercy. Look at me. Look at me. Some of you about one second away from being called out. Again, if you're bored, flip over in the back, start looking at the verses. Um, those of you that are watching at home, I hope you sat up straight as well. And uh, keep forgetting about that thing. It was a salvation, and it was a mercy. It didn't kill everybody in the house. It was just the firstborn that night. It was just the oldest. And God, even in wrath, showed mercy there. God provides deliverance there. You say, that's so severe. Everybody's dying. I want you to get it. There have been nine warnings ahead of this. Been nine warnings ahead of this. told the story a little bit, and we're, we're going to be done in about just a few minutes here. I told the story of it. I had, years ago, I was single, just unbelievably single. Um, was heading on, heading on, going to be heading down to Florida to finish some school, do some more schooling. And I, was, I was finishing up, people were having me at their houses, and, and young couple, a young couple, brother and sister, excuse me, a couple of students were part of our ministry. Their dad was trying to revitalize the church had just about just about gone under and they invited us over he was a foreman at a plant beautiful home nice home and and and, and uh and he he's there and, and one of the kids acted up and he went like this that's one and the kid straightened up and scared and and all that and i just i didn't know what's going on and then we were sitting at the table and the kid did something else and he said that's that's two and the kids started crying and i'm and i'm I, I, you know, I'm just a guest, and I don't know what this man's doing and all. And the oldest boy, he's a football player, was a senior, was a great young man, good guy, brought his friends to Christ, and I got to baptize some of his friends and all, and just, just a neat guy. And he mouthed off, said something smart, and his dad sitting right across from him looked at him and said, that's one to the 18-year-old. I watched the blood drain out of his face. And I said, I don't understand what just one, two is. All I know is every time you do that, everybody sits up a little straighter but me because I'm ignorant. And he looked at me and said, I made up my mind some years ago. My wife and I, we've been to some conference. We decided that we were given the wrong impression of who God was and what a parent was supposed to do if we just said, you do it one more time, you do it one more time, you do it one more time. And so we just decided. 
You can be a kid, and we're not talking about just being silly, but one and two and three, it's all over. And we've never bluffed. And I'm watching his oldest kids going. And their, their very oldest child had, had been pregnant out of wedlock. They'd actually adopted the child and were raising their grandchild as their own. And so when they looked at the grandchild, went like number two, and she started squalling. Everybody sat a little straighter because they knew what was coming, judgment. And I wrote that down, and I, I thought about that. I said, man, that's, that's something good to do. Here, here's, what you, here's what's going on if you, if you miss it, if you don't miss it. When God is working here and when God's doing all this stuff, what, what, what happens is because God didn't turn us into a greasy spot. Last time we said something uglier. Last time we took a picture and we said it we shouldn't have. Last time, last time we, we got drunk or whatever. We go, well, he must not really care too much. I got news for you. Somebody's paying for your sin. Somebody's paying for it. And the wheels of God's uh, wheels of God's judgment grind slowly, but they grind surely. And just because He's acting in mercy now, but you can count on it. You can count on it. The most foolish thing in the world is go. Well, it's always going to be like this. I'm never going to get in trouble. I'm never going to get caught. I have a list of fifteen things I pray for Andre. A list of fifteen things I pray for our kids. And I pray for three at a time. Then when I get to day 16, I just kind of start to list over. So I pray sections of three. And about, so about whatever, about every eight days, about every eight days I pray for our kids that when they sin, they get caught. Because the worst thing in the world is to presume on God. Say, so do you pray for Andre to get caught? I'm not telling. And uh, God provides, except forgiveness. Except forgiveness. Do you see any similarities here between the Passover and Jesus' sacrifice? Do you see any similarities? Anybody see any similarities? Can there are no wrong answers here? The runs a safe zone. One plus one equals blue. You're fine, whatever you want to say. Yeah, both were to be a lamb without blemish. There's no fault in them. There's no reason that they should have to be sacrificed. What else? That's a good one. That's a good one. That's excellent, Mr. Glass. But yeah, go ahead, Tom. It was going to be gruesome. It was going to be violent. Be what we call shedding of blood. We don't really say that in 2020 when we say bloodshed. We, we flip it around a bit. It's going, it's going to be violent. And again, if you get all icky, maybe you've forgotten just how awful your sin is. Yeah, go ahead, Tommy. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't just enough to know about it. It wasn't just enough for your neighbor to have it done. You had to personally take ownership. It's not enough for your cousin or your grandparent or your aunt or your uncle or your stepmom or stepdad. You have to do this. It's a personal thing for you, for it to matter. For it to matter. Anybody else? There's a couple more I thought of, but these are great. These are great. Anybody else? They couldn't make their own thing up, right? No, they couldn't do their own thing. Yeah. Yeah, they couldn't, they couldn't show up that day going, all right, I got a bunch of turnips. Right? They couldn't. I couldn't do it. They couldn't. Well, I just, well, it doesn't matter as long as I did something, right? God prescribed what was to happen. See, Christianity is about love and tolerance. Christianity might be about love, but every religion I know anything about is very intolerant. Only, only recently all this stuff that's all wishy-washy. Again, everybody gets it. We can't all be right. Somebody's wrong. So you better figure out who's right. I can just be sincere. Again, you you can be sincere and be sincerely dead. Um, sincerely wrong. What can we learn about sin and forgiveness? Sin's costly. Sin's expensive. 
sin requires someone outside of ourselves to pay for, right? They had to get a lamb. It wasn't something they could do. It was Jesus. He had to come, be born of a virgin, never sin, die on the cross for our sins. It had to be that way. There's a second thing that's there. You still with me? Go ahead, Tommy. The second thing there. No, no, this was a this was a once a year kind of thing for them in that in that, in that sense. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. There was significance. Oh yeah. That's right. Yeah. There's a the once a year was traded out for the once for all of the sacrifice of Christ. Boy, that is excellent. That is excellent. God not only paid what was demanded of them, and again, God set his people free. And let me just make application here. You've got 430 years that they have been living in Egypt and then the last of those enslaved in Egypt. We're going to figure out that there's about 600,000 men. You're going to add the women or their wives in there and then their children. You will quickly get to somewhere in the neighborhood of two million plus. Some folks estimate again because, as is typical in a slave situation, again they're just they come home and this is kind of all that there is. But that number is probably closer to three to four million. You got three to four million, and they are treated poorly because they realize if you give them any slack, they can run us over. Because if you got slaves doing all the heavy lifting, guess who the strongest members of society are? The ones doing all the outdoor work. So you got two to three million, and a whole lot of them are day laborers, and they are muscular. And so you treat them poorly, you threaten them. And God says it's time for them to go. It's time for them to move along. And for all these, and again, if you divide that up, if you just take the 600,000, the 600,000 lambs, then the next year, 600,000, then you start having the tabernacle and the temple sacrifices. You get into multiple millions and millions of animals. And if that really throws you, that's a drop in the bucket to what we eat here in America just on a daily basis and, and those kind of things. But if you're doing it all by hand, you kind of get the picture. God sets his people free. He set them free. And we get the picture of physical and, and, and almost militaristic deliverance without the military. God just lets it, makes it happen. Wait for it. God never intended for any of us to stay in bondage to our sins. He never intended. You are free. You're as free as you want to be. Say, boy, I got a potty mouth. You, you, you got as much a bad mouth as you want to be. Say, I, I, you, you got as much of that if you're a Christ follower as you want. You've been absolutely positively set free. When I got a hold of Romans 6 and Romans 7, and I figured out that I was no longer a slave to sin, boy, I started changing everything in my life. Say, preacher, you ever struggle with anything? Absolutely. You ever tempted all the time. If that offends you, then maybe, maybe we need to talk to you. I really thought the older I get, the less temptation than I have. I just figured out temptations change a little bit. I still got to walk in the Spirit and confess my sins just like anybody else does. But I'm as free as I want to be because He has set me free. He has delivered me from the kingdom of darkness. If you were courageous enough to write down anything on your paper a moment ago or to walk through a list of things that you struggle with or a sinful habit or things that are bothersome to you, things you know hurt the heart of God, I want you to write beside of them, free, free, paid for, in the past. They no longer have dominion over me. One of the happiest days in some of our lives be, man, we figure out we're free. Free from our sins, free from our guilt, free from our shame. They would leave Egypt to never return again. By the way, the New Testament uses Egypt as a type of the world and a type of sin, and it fits real well. They had no sooner gotten out and gotten away from everybody than they started mumbling, grumbling, and complaining and going, man, at least we had, 
At least we had this back in Egypt. At least we had garlic back in Egypt. At least we had some onions back in Egypt. And if you're always looking in the rearview mirror, I got news for you. You didn't get too good a look at the cross. And you had not got a real good look at the glory of Christ. Because he's altogether lovely. And he will thrill you. And he is greater and bigger and better than anything that's in your past. Sometimes our Jesus is too small. Our sin is too small. And the world looks too tempting. Author Hebrews says it like this. Moses, when he compared himself with the pleasures of Egypt, he forsook it, looking for a builder, kingdom, maker, founder, God. Wait for it. There is pleasure in sin for a season. Only a dishonest person would tell you that. That's a short time with an absolutely giant hangover. But to follow Christ and to be free and to be free. You can be free. You can be free from your habit. You can be free from your addiction. You can be free from your smirk. You can be, you can be free. You can love your parents the way you're supposed to. You, you can be faithful to God the way you're supposed to. You can be absolutely positively set free. Our friend Pat Hall started a, a church down in Wilmington, South Carolina, Wilmington, North Carolina. Pat's been engaged, trying to work with the addiction community and and just work through. And, and God's done some neat things. They've been able to rent two homes as kind of staging areas, halfway houses for people as they're getting cleaned up and getting in the Word and and getting them a job. And it's just a neat thing what they're doing. And and and, and he's partnered with a local group. And they met at his church. Monday night, and Pat got to get up there and go, I was a drunk, and I was a rebel, and I was a blasphemer, and God saved me, and God saved my wife, and he delivered me, and he called me to preach, and we started the church, and I stand in front of you tonight, would save children and save grandchildren, and God changed me, and he set me free, and Pat said, and I don't know if anybody else got anything, but it was good for me to say it again out loud. The way he delivered me, he can deliver you. You don't have to live in Egypt anymore. Anymore when the Lamb of God took our place. When the Lamb of God took our place. If you can find a pencil, it's not the world's worst exercise. Write them out. Hard as you can go, long as you can go. And if you're a follower of his, start taking that eraser. And if that doesn't sufficiently move you, May I suggest you find a red marker. And this has been canceled. And this has been canceled. And this has been paid for. And he did it all for me. And you may still have the scars and they may stay with you until you get the new body. But I can promise you, when the Lamb took our place, he did it absolutely, positively, perfectly. Praise